Is the romantic archetype of the great artist finished? And if so, what is replacing it? No, I don't think it is finished. I think there are still absolutely great artists uh, who produce work that's on a level with with which only a small few others uh, produce anything comparable. Um, and I think you can find hierarchies of artistic production in most uh, in most cultures in the world and in most periods in history. Um, whether the particular archetype that was promoted by the Romantics and the idea of the somewhat aloof artist uh, and the artist as a seer of special truths not really available to anyone else, whether that has the same currency today as it might have had in the early 19th century, I'm less sure. But I still think there are absolutely great artists, and I still think it's important that art forms a type of activity which uh, interacts with the wider society, but doesn't just simply mirror it or isn't simply determined with it by it. So I do believe in art existing in a dialectical relationship with the rest of society and culture. And I do distinguish the words art and culture, and that's even allowing for multiple different meanings of the term culture itself. Right. Well, there are those who would say that the the very idea of the great artist is something that should be called into question in the sense that it it, it seems to indicate, what would you say, uh, well, a, a hierarchy to begin with, a hierarchy of, of competence or of, or of importance that, that some would call into question. They would, they would instead espouse perhaps a more uh, flat horizon, a more flat landscape in which everybody potentially can, can contribute, as opposed to the, the uh, I'm caricaturing this perhaps, but the, the, the great man archetype of people like Stravinsky, uh, T.S. Eliot, Kandinsky, Schoenberg, and so on. Well, I'd ask if uh, they would extend that anti-hierarchical view into popular culture, say. I mean, would they say that the reason why Taylor Swift or Beyoncé are such global superstars, compared to many others that only a small community have ever heard of, is that entirely arbitrary? Um, is that not something to do with how they sing, how they dance, how they perform, the things that they do sing, or whatever? I mean, this is putting whatever views I might have about either of those artists uh, to one side, but I don't really believe anyone truly thinks that there are no distinctions, no hierarchies between different types of artists in whatever form. Um, and... You know, if it's just down to as simple a thing as a conversation between two people who've been watching something on television the previous evening, uh, they'll often talk about what they thought of it, how good it was. Um, some One might think it's better than the other does. You're already setting up a hierarchy in that very process. Value judgment, I think, is a very common and perhaps even intrinsic human activity when confronted with art, confronted with culture. And... It's only perhaps a small few academics, including semester musicologists and anthropologists, who seem to think you can uh, totally bracket out value judgment or that somehow it's some, it's some great sin. I don't think so. I think it goes on all the time. And the moment you have value judgments about any culture, then you create hierarchies between those who produce it. Okay. I want to stay on this question of artistic greatness, of, of the great artist for a moment, because this is very much on my mind at present. First of all, how would you define a great artist in, in the present day context? What would that sort of a figure do and what would their role be within society? Right. Well, those are two quite different questions, I think. Um, I mean, very simply, um, I'd say a great artist is one who produces a lot of great art, uh, but I realise that doesn't really answer the question, then what what constitutes great art? Um, and I'm not sure if I can really can answer that question in any sort of comprehensive way. Um, I can believe that such a thing like great art does exist, um, but what? Why exactly it's great, and it's so much greater than a lot of a lot of other things, is often quite a complex question, and needs to be addressed in each individual case. If you could say this is what makes great art, that almost suggests that there's a formula for producing it, which I don't believe there is. Well, I think but, for, to start with, just to just to uh, unravel this a little bit, the greatness of the art does not reside 
only in the art itself. So for, it has something to do with the way the, the art, or the, indeed the artist, uh, interfaces with their society. And the, the greatness has something to do with magnitude, the, 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 to, to use a word that is perhaps not ideal, but the impact that the artist may be having or may not be having. If the, if the work is, is great but exists in a drawer uh, and is not, uh, is not doing anything real in the world besides simply besides merely existing, then can we ascribe greatness to that? Well, last year I went to see the Vermeer exhibition that was on in Amsterdam, which was absolutely incredible. Probably the greatest art exhibition I've ever seen. Now, I know that Vermeer's paintings languished relatively unknown for quite an extended period until they were rediscovered. I think it was some point in the 19th century. Um... Now, they didn't have the impact that they have now in the earlier times, and they didn't have a critical and scholarly apparatus that developed around them, and which I do believe conditions, to some extent, the reception of art, and I don't mean that in a negative way. Um, but I don't, I don't see any necessary reason why, if they hadn't had that in earlier times, they wouldn't have been thought just as great then. So what I'm trying to say from that is I don't think uh, the reasons we think Vermeer is great now are limited to our current temporal moment. I think it's something much more intrinsic in the art, which gives the potential for a particular level of impact. Um, but I don't think that is something grafted on artificially. I think that has to somehow come out of the intrinsic qualities of the art itself, which to me as sort of self-evidently monumental in Vermeer's case. Um, so I'm just trying to remember the rest of your question. Well, would there be... Hmm, is it more difficult to make a claim for greatness if the artist is addressing, perhaps, an extraordinarily restricted audience, or or perhaps even no one at all, as opposed to... The, the Vermeer case is, is interesting because you could certainly put forth the argument that Vermeer is, is addressing very simple, universal concepts in his work that speak to a large number of people. If we get into modernism and wherever it is we are now, you get into uh, uh, an archetype of an artist that is extraordinarily, in, in many instances, detached from uh, the reality of the reality of the society in which they're living. And perhaps even dealing with 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 artistic aesthetic concepts that are so esoteric by their very nature that such universal universality though it may be buried in there somewhere is going to be extraordinarily difficult for most people to locate well I'll never take two of the examples that you suggested before Stravinsky and T.S. Eliot the means that they were using uh, for conveying uh, their art might have been to some extent esoteric at the time, perhaps more so in Eliot's case than at least the early Stravinsky. Um, but I think they were dealing with with concerns that were extremely uh, urgent at the time. In, in the early Stravinsky, dealing with issues of primitivism, of folklorism, with stylized barbarism and so on, uh, which for the works he was writing at the beginning of the 1910s, uh, and they now look incredibly prescient, I think, in knowledge of what happened in the succeeding decades. In the case of Eliot, I mean, he was engaging with popular culture, with sort of popular song and, um, and ballads and things like that, and looking at the modern city and the whole alienation that came with, that came with that, and looking at the state of... Uh, religion at his in his in his own time. These were not very simply private concerns to Eliot himself. The way he assembled these into his montage like works, uh, quite heavily, I would say, inspired by sort of Baudelaire's view of the city as well, um, might have been part of a technical approach that was at that stage relatively unfamiliar to uh, readers. But those things have become absorbed into much wider cultural vernaculars. And so I suppose in both cases, I am questioning whether this work really was so cut off uh, from society, whether it was so esoteric, because I think it was dealing with sort of very socially, they, in both cases, they were dealing with very socially and politically urgent things. And I think they remain so. 
Now, in their cases, whether those would will still remain so in 200 years from now, well, I can only guess. Um, I believe so. I mean, again, I'm speculating there, but I believe so in the same way that, you know, I can read Dante nowadays, and that is a cr- incredibly vivid to me. Um, some of the... Some of the more esoteric uh, pieces of medieval theology take take at least some sort of extra annotations to understand, I find, certainly the stuff in Paradiso. Um, but nonetheless, uh, as a narrative, as, as a form of social commentary, when this incredible thing of deciding which circles of hell you will consign uh, people you know and public figures to... Uh, I think it's absolutely gripping, even though um, it dates from best part of a millennium ago. Um, And I don't necessarily see any reason why Stravinsky and Elliot won't be the same. I do think some very, very topical art that deals with very, very much issues of their time, which do not necessarily project out much further, tends to date a lot more. Um... And this is the reason that I'm quite sceptical about a lot of explicitly political art. No, not all. Um, but stuff that's absolutely rooted in response to concrete events. Um, well, there's, there's various reasons uh, that, that I'm sceptical about it. One is the obvious one that when those events cease to be current, um, the art loses a lot of its immediacy. But there's also the issue of whether there's something exploitative about this, uh, whether it's sort of rendering atrocities into art, whether it's taking some of the edge off them by rendering them aesthetic, which is sort of how Adorno's critique of that uh, worked. Well, or, unless unless there's something in the style and substance of the work that is so transcendently interesting that the the pretext for its creation simply falls by the wayside. So, for instance, if you take... This is a, 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 a random example, I suppose, but if you take the, the novels of or the, the journalistic work of Hunter S. Thompson. So the things that he was describing at the time uh, are no longer of particular public interest. They're, they're political events or, or uh, uh, events of the day that, that are now decades beyond us. So, uh, But nevertheless, there's something in the style, in the, in the substance of those works, that is phenomenally interesting and that transcends the original subject matter. So in the best case... Uh, in the best case, I think that that the work can survive on that basis. Yeah, I absolutely agree, and that's a sort of testament to um, quite quite what a good writer Hunter S. Thompson was. Uh, it's why it's, it's probably a mistake to see his work primarily in terms of the specific events uh, that he's looking at, but rather in terms of the much wider concerns that he's drawing out of them. And yes, I could say that about any number of other things. I could say that about Guernica, for example. Um, so where does that leave the statement that I was just making before? Um, I think it's about sort of distinguishing... I'm going to use some very old-fashioned vocabulary here. Distinguishing between human concerns and localised political concerns. Um... No, what would I'm trying to think of some other examples? I mean, there's Ode to Napoleon, for example, or or the Eroica yes. Symphony. I mean, yes. you're, oh, yeah. you're you're entering into the realm of archetypes and symbols, and, uh, and that so there may be a, a, a contemporary pretext for producing the work. It, it may re- refer on some level to a contemporary figure. Well, let me give you another example of something of the opposite tendency, but it's actually someone whose work I rather like. Uh, I don't know if you know the British playwright James Graham. No. All right. He's prob- well, there's probably a reason why you don't know him, and probably not many people outside of Britain know him. Um, he's very obsessed with British politics, as am I. Um, and he's written a whole load of plays which are dramatising particular events in British politics. Um, he wrote a play called The House, which is set in the House of Commons during the 70s, and it's set in the whip's office, the people who whip up support for things, and it follows all the machinations that go on and how exactly they manipulate people to uh, to get their vote. At a particular time in British history where the 
the Labour Party who were in power lost their majority in the House of Commons through losing various by-elections. Uh, and even even before they lost it, it was down to one or two votes could mean whether they would lose or win uh, some, uh, some parliamentary vote. Um, now, he traces this, and it's, if you're interested in that, which I am, it's absolutely fascinating. And he, he, he wrote a screenplay for about how the Brexit campaign was managed by Dominic Cummings, uh, who was played by Benedict Cumberbatch in that. And um, what I, I say, I enjoy his things. I'll always go and watch uh, the new ones. But I could see if you don't have that very specialised interest, I'm not sure how much else would come out. I suppose something about the way the business of politics works in general, um, for which parallels could be found in other contexts as well. Um, but I think it goes quite light on those things. And so I'd say I like seeing them, but I, they're not particularly plays I'd want to see uh, many times or that I imagine uh, will have any sort of long-lasting sort of impact. Uh, so... So I suppose I suppose that's what I'm thinking of. The other objections that I'm saying about political art, I think, are possibly uh, more vivid in their own way. Uh, so I have problems even with the work like Luigi Nono's "The God Cosi Tiano Fatto in Auschwitz," which was written as originally as incidental music for uh, Peter Weiss's play "Die Ermittlung," uh, the investigation which was essentially a reconstruction of parts of the Frankfurt-Auschwitz trials. And in his programme note for the work, Nono himself says uh, that what the transcripts of the trials can't uh, represent is the voice of the six million dead, and that's what he wants to do in his music. Now, I think, first of all, that's incredibly presumptuous, um, and I don't think any artist should claim to be doing that um but beyond that it's it's a strangely very beautiful piece um it's very haunting piece um it's a piece dare i say to enjoy and well you can see where i'm leading from that uh, it's turning genocide into an aesthetic spectacle so if Adorno said uh, at one point, I know he retracted this later, he said there could be no lyric poetry after Auschwitz. Well, this is making lyric poetry out of Auschwitz, uh, which is moving on to a whole different level. And I just don't think it's an appropriate response. It's funny, I had a, a similar reaction to a much more recent piece, which is the opera Innocence by Kaya Sariaho, which is uh, an opera dealing with school shootings. Uh, oh, yes, I haven't seen it. Right. Well, it, it so it, it it documents the story of a of a school shooting in in quite uh, quite uh, horrendous detail, and presents this as a as an aesthetic object, I suppose. And that um, that made me intensely uncomfortable. And you could argue, well, that's perhaps the that's perhaps the point is to is to put that in your face and 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 present the reality of it in a in a context where one might not be expecting such a thing. But uh, but it seemed. To me, at the time, and I, this is acknowledging the, the greatness of the work, I think it is her best opera. I think it's a, it's a very fine work. The musical substance of it is outstanding. But nevertheless, it, it, it raised a, a question in my mind. Is this actually appropriate? Is this something that one can, one can address in an opera? Well, I'm interested to know more about the, mus the types of musical means she used and what you think made it particularly a set of size there. I suppose the question I would always ask there is, why is this an opera? Why is it not a film? Why is it not a play? Why is it not a documentary even? I remember someone talking about a projected piece that would deal with uh, the phenomenon of punch and duty shows here and what that meant in terms of domestic violence at the time. Uh, you know, very relevant concern, absolutely, but I was... I never really got around to asking them why was this why is this piece of music though? And why are you using a particular artistic medium? And it's something I wonder about a lot of work I see nowadays where I think the nominal subject matter uh seems to be seems to have an importance way over and above what the musical content is and somehow 
is seen by some as to render questions of the musical value almost irrelevant. Um, but in the end, if it is a work of music, I want to know why music's being used uh, for this. I mean, supposing... I want to I want to get off a sort of Nazi example because those are so full of problems, but I could imagine someone setting a gulag chorus or something in opera, and I could imagine this being absolutely dreadful mm. if it was done a certain way. It could it could make light of the gulag experience so much, um, and you know I can think of other things even in I mean, opera. I like very much uh, Billy Bird of Britain, but. Uh, I know how brutalising the conditions were uh, in the Royal Navy at that time. Now, I mean, some of that comes across, certainly through the flogging scene and things like that. Um, but when you see them singing their sea shanties uh, at night, there's a sort of sense that they've found some reasonably happy reconciliation to their lot. Now, that might have been a necessity for sure, but uh, somehow it just seems all a bit too warm at that at that point i mean i'm I'm probably being a bit harsh on that because that opera certainly does deal in some senses with other aspects um but yes i'm i'm back again to the question of why why use music and particularly why have something sung rather than spoken or why even fictionalize something in some cases now i can certainly see arguments for doing so in in even even including things which are dealing with great atrocities, sometimes a fiction can reveal a reality that a documentary approach uh, might not. Um, but I think these questions can easily be treated rather too lightly. Um, we've gone off on a bit of a tangent, and I'm not. I feel like I need to return to some thread, but I've forgotten exactly where we were. You were talking about Sariajo's yes. opera. Um, which I really want to see and I haven't seen now. And I was thinking of other examples. What, well, there's a piece I wrote for The Conversation a few years ago uh, where I looked a bit critically at the Nonna work and also at Penderecki's Threnody, which, as we know, was given its title about Hiroshima after it was composed. Um, the, the very fact of that makes me a bit sceptical, uh, whether this is sort of appropriating uh, a traumatic event to to artificially sort of paste on some relevance to a work. Opportunistically also, yes. yes, yeah. But as comparing with actually a more musically conservative work in some senses, but I do think it's remarkable being Shostakovich's 11th, 13th Symphony uh, after poems by Yevtushenko uh, to, do, to do in part with the Babi Yar massacre. There is actually a range of poems that deal with several subjects. Um, but that... What that doesn't, that simply doesn't become is a type of atrocity pornography. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's remarkable for that. Shostakovich resists that temptation um, to write some sort of, some sort of lamentosa work which will never be sufficient for the scale of what's being represented. So no, I think it's a piece that actually invites a form of active rational engagement with what it's doing rather than using it as for some sort of emotional catharsis and maybe that's the thing i think using uh, using traumatic events uh, for that purpose i think is in questionable taste at the very least mm -hmm. and i've you know i've written a bit recently about endless pieces we get about climate change um it's very fashionable to write pieces about climate change now, if I'm going to look critically at this, don't think for a moment this means I'm trying to sort of, uh, in any sense, minimise the importance of climate change as an issue. I think it's absolutely urgent, and I think the consequences are incredibly serious in so many respects. Um, but I just wonder what people are doing by writing a piece of music about it, which will probably get heard by a small community of listeners in the new music world, few of who will need convincing that climate change is a bad thing. Mm. Um, whether it's really whether these things are really adding to our understanding any more so than could be done by other means. Um, well, I, I suspect it's a form of in-group affirmation, yes. <laughs> ultimately. And there's a lot of that in the new music community. 
Sure, and that's not new. Um, I mean, some of the political references, even in Mozart operas, may have actually taken the same form. Uh, that when he was writing Don Giovanni singing Viva la Libertà, um, he wasn't particularly saying something to uh, to his audiences as to some of his patrons to show that he was in support of uh, a particular political direction there. So in a sense, that was a type of virtue signaling to an in-crowd as well. But I think... I mean, I don't want. It would be too harsh just to condemn such things out of hand. Um, I suppose I'm bothered when I think these become the primary focus of attention, and the rest of the music doesn't seem to count for very much. And I see this certainly in academic contexts with music, where ultimately people there are many composers employed by universities who are often writing in and in some sort of what i might say post avant-garde idiom uh, for now so which draws upon some of the techniques and styles and genres that were associated with the avant-garde at its peak um, rather than necessarily uh, developing wholly new ones um, but in a language which will ultimately be esoteric to many academic managers, to many research funding bodies, uh, to many of the other people that they have to please in order to secure a solid future within academia. And so if they can link their piece to other things which are not in themselves anything necessarily to do with music, um, this is a good career strategy. And if that sounds a bit of a cynical view, it's because it is. Those two things are not necessarily mutually exclusive. You can no. you, you can have a an optimized career strategy and also be a great artist. Uh, and in fact, I think the great the great artist who is hopelessly unable to uh, to communicate with anybody uh, who is uh, socially inept and who can't uh, make a, a strong case for their work is is going to be at a significant disadvantage. I would imagine. Yeah. No. I I I do agree with that. But I think it's possible to make a case for for work in in other terms. Um, but I recognise that's hard for those working in particular, as I say, post avant-garde idioms. And that might actually say something reluctant, though I am, uh, to go down this road about whether it's ever possible that those idioms in themselves uh, can have any wider communicative potential. Well, it, Com it, it, communicative is probably not the best word. The whole series of communications have their own sorts of um, qualities, which are not necessarily the best, the most applicable to music. Uh, maybe I like using the word, though it's become a bit of a cliche, resonance, or whether music resonates and it's got a literal musical uh, dimension to it. As I say, it's just become a little bit overused as to become hackneyed, but I think it's possible that music can resonate rather than, in some sense, conveying a meaning. Mm -hmm. Or it can be meaningful without having a meaning. It's doesn't, it doesn't have an object uh, in the same way as, say, figurative art does, or a lot of uses of language uh, can. Well, it's certainly possible for esoteric aesthetic directions to communicate to a, a very large number of people that's happened on many occasions the 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 classic example is possibly the the rite of spring which is enormously popular work and and has a has an immediate power of seduction and expression that is that is self-evident uh as for where that may stand in the present day i'm considerably less convinced about composers able uh, to take what might be by contemporary standards uh, might be, let's say, uh, uh, esoteric or, or, or aesthetics that notably diverge from uh, the bulk of musical practices in the composition world and, and manage to find a large audience doing that. I don't know. I, I think that that would be extraordinarily difficult. I haven't seen too many examples of that, certainly. And if I were to survey the composition landscape of the past 30 or 40 years, what, what are the individual works that have had anything like even a, a an iota of uh, significance in comparison with a work like the Rite of Spring. Now, you could argue that's something that reveals itself over time, that that uh, we need decades, perhaps half a century or more, before the uh, the work reveals itself in its full dimensions. But 
but I don't think that's necessarily the case. There are certainly works that that find a, a, a broad audience and and create a significant uh, impact very shortly after their premiere. It just doesn't seem to be happening. And this is something that that emerged as a kind of leitmotif in the discussions I had with with intellectuals, public figures. Uh, people from the business world who attended the art conference in London back in October. Now, I had the opportunity to exchange with quite a number of people at that event, including prominent intellectuals from all sides of the political spectrum. And one recurring motif was the question, what are the artists doing? Where are they? Where have they gone? Where are the great figures of today? We mentioned T.S. Eliot and Stravinsky as two sort of emblematic examples, but is there anybody today who can claim to have anything like that measure of public notoriety, significance, uh, critical attention. Um, I'm quite doubtful about that. Well, at least maybe not in the high cultural field. In popular cultural fields, then possibly. I'm not sure right now, but at least in the last 50 years, I can think of, I can think of figures there. Uh, you know, I can think of various popular musicians, I can think of jazz musicians, late jazz musicians, because I sort of think jazz morphed into other things around about the time of the 1970s uh, onwards. Um, well, that sort of what I call the one last push theory, that if we wait a bit of time and we push things like new music just a bit more, eventually audiences will come around. Right. No, this is... I mean, I don't believe that. <laughs> I don't believe that for a second. The The idea, and this has been floated since at least the 1950s, if not longer, is that, well, it's because audiences aren't familiar enough with it. So if you can educate them, if you can explain to them what's going on in the work, then they'll come around to it. The problem is that they don't have the context, they don't understand what artists are doing, so you need to, you need to be an advocate, you need to explain it to them, and so on. In my experience, that simply doesn't work. There are... There are branches of, uh, of of new music that simply do not have the capacity, I believe, to communicate broadly to a large number of people. And it's to do with the work. It's not to do with uh, with deficiencies in the sensibility or the education or the, uh, the experience of the people who are listening. Uh, now, that's an attitude that you see quite commonly uh, in composers, modernist composers such as Elliot Carter, who, who is constantly saying things along the lines that, um, well, the music is difficult, but people will just have to become more clever. And, well, where does that lead you? Well, can I take a sort of middle ground position on this? I go home after I've been working hard someday, and I don't always want to read some Goethe. I don't always uh, want to be watching some classic Japanese cinema. Um, I don't always want to be listening to some late Brahms. Uh, these are all things I like ex very much indeed. But yes, I sometimes want something uh, a bit lighter that's not unintelligent but is entertaining and gives me a chance to relax a bit. And I never criticize anyone else for wanting to do the same um i would worry a lot if that's all there was in culture and i do and i think that's a very real uh worry to have but i mean i started asking myself a while ago maybe at least 10 years ago maybe even more um of a lot of the types of avant-garde music that i've played how often do i choose to actually listen to them mm. myself and I mean, I certainly do, but not as often as one might think. I mean, when it's just listening because I'm interested rather than listening because I need to learn more about something because I'm writing about it or I'm listening to recordings uh, in the process of preparing an interpretation or something like that. But just listening if, for pleasure doesn't seem quite the right way to put it, but listening for my own edification I suppose. I've thought it's not actually all that often. And then I ask myself similarly, how often do I listen to early music? Uh, same way. Or how often would I listen to some, even something like uh, the Matas Passion? Uh, um, they're, they're for special occasions. I mean, there are times when I've got when I've got time when I've got a clear head and I really want to concentrate and I really want something that goes as deep as those things are. And... 
if you know, as someone who's quite intensely involved with these things as part of their work, if it's not so often that uh, I get the chance to do that, then what's the chance for those working in other fields uh, who, 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 who don't have that? But st- but from that, I still don't think that necessarily has to be a problem. Uh, I think there can be many forms of art which are, let's go back to our re- the first question, which are great, which are demanding, um, and which are not probably for sort of casual or recreational viewing, listening, reading, or whatever. Um, but I don't think that in any sense minimises uh, their significance or their importance. Um, well, it's you, one but, thing. But, yes. I, I mean, I, but if, I, if I could just continue one thing yeah. on that, because uh, I want to look, I mean, the Elliot Carter example is interesting there. In a sense, I can see that I can view Carter's work as, which I like very much, and I played most of his uh, piano music, uh, is an extension of that. And, and Carter's work, if I say, there's in one small sense it's slightly conservative i don't mean that in any sort of denigratory fashion i mean in the sense this music that situates itself in a particular relationship to traditions which i think is quite clear mm-hmm. um it it's not it's not radically iconoclastic work never has been um not in the way that certainly things like cage or schnabel or globacar might be not things that are that are really sort of uh, trying to make you redefine the whole question of what music is. Um, Carter's work uses an expressive language which has a clear lineage behind it. He uses forms which are certainly informed by his own particular means, uh, not least on a metrical level, but on the other hand, they still somehow relate to established forms uh, in things and so that that gives a point of reference that gives uh, for those familiar with that tradition uh, you can hear it relative listen to it relative to that tradition if you're familiar with that and what that would mean to someone not familiar with that tradition is not necessarily so so clear but and this is the question like I think so many involved in new music I've evaded for a long time, uh, but I can't really get away from is about is simply about atonality. Now, if I define atonality as or atonal music is music which is not organised around single tonal centres for any appreciable uh, amount of time. I mean, I don't think there's all. I don't think there's almost any fully atonal music music where you can't hear some localised tonal centres at various points, but they're so diffuse and so changing in atonal music as um, to essentially eschew that sort of sense of uh, some gravitational force such as a more long-range tonal organisation provides. Um, Atonal music is disorienting. It is alienating, I think, to an awful lot of people. I mean, every bit of evidence points to that the lack of much of an atonal tradition in almost any other world culture. Perhaps you could find some something akin in, say, Gagaku music or so on, uh, but it's not really comparable. I, I wonder about this. I, uh, this is a question that I ask myself quite often as well. Now, I don't think I'm being self-deluding about this, because obviously I write completely chromatic music, and indeed sometimes infrachromatic music with microtones and so on. My sense is, having worked with a lot of students and having having exchanged with a very broad range of audience members through my public lecturing and through the, the work I've done as a composer as well, my sense is that the, the the organization of the tones is not really at the forefront of most people's concerns when they're listening to things and finding them perhaps too esoteric or too difficult to handle. I think the absence of identifiable patterns in music is extremely challenging for audiences, but that can come through through any means, actually. It's not simply a matter of the organization of tones. I think it may have to do somewhat with rhythm. I think that the the tendency of the second Viennese school composers, for example, uh, and certainly the, the generation that came after that, to work with rhythmic patterns that do not that do not uh, relate in any obvious manner to to a meter, to a pattern. Uh, 
I think that that's more destabilizing than any degree of uh, 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 atonality in the music. And th there are so many examples of, uh, of ostensibly tonal music that is so far into the margins of what constitutes any kind of functionality that it's difficult to make a case for the piece being in this or that key. So, for example, you can cite certain, uh, certain passages in Wagner, you can cite uh, Hugo Wolf, certainly, where it's extraordinarily difficult to determine if many of those songs are, in fact, in a key at all. You can cite Debussy, you can look at uh, uh, certain works by Hindemith, you can look at um, things like the Bagatelle sans tonalité of Liszt. Uh, those works don't seem to disturb anybody. Well, the Bagatelle sans tonalité, I'd say, is in B minor. Um, <laughs> okay, well, that settles it. <laughs> uh, I think what, it's simply a piece that lacks uh, a clear tonic and root position rather than lacks a tonal center. There's, a, there's, very, there's very clear tonal organization in that. Um, it's nothing like the cut adrift in the way that sort of Schoenberg from Opus 11 onwards is. And when you're talking about recognizable patterns, well, what about in the Schoenberg Suite Opus 25 or the Third String Quartet or the Variations for Orchestra? Does these not use a quite readily recognizable rhythmic vocabulary and gestural vocabulary as well, which I thought, I, I mean, I've seen some fascinating talks about these works, which actually push the tone, the pitch organization to one side and look at them more primarily in gestural terms um, and actually how subtle the gestural and rhythmic working is in them. And which, you know, which, which, which I find fascinating. It's a lot more than about what makes these, to my mind, quite remarkable pieces than just saying how the rose manipulated. But sorry, it's a little tangent here, but you might find this quite interesting here that... Um, I was just in a conference at Dublin last week, uh, and I was sort of supporting a postgraduate student who was giving a paper, which I had some input into. Uh, we're looking at uh, the role of music theory analysis comparatively in Scottish and Irish educational systems, um, and how this relates to secondary provision and so on. And one thing she found from talking to teachers in Scotland is they said, serialism is a gift for teaching because uh, it's not difficult for students to learn how to just invert and retrogate the row and then just combine that and they create something in the process. Um, yeah, whether it's something you ever want to listen to um, is another question. But, I mean, this to me betrays such a narrow understanding of what serial music is and certainly what the serial music of Schoenberg or Berg or Weben is, that there are so many other aspects which... Uh, defining to what makes it so distinctive. It's not. It's not just about the Roman manipulation. And you know, as, as we know, Schoenberg uh, reacted quite negatively to Rudolf Kurlisch, uh coming back and saying, "I've worked out where this is how the row works in the third string quartet." Um, so, I suppose I'm, I'm I'm saying from this that I'm not sure that those other factors that you think are probably more important for listeners than pitch organization. I'm not sure if those things aren't present in a lot of these works, which nonetheless have never gone on to have the same sustained and wide listenership that works of Stravinsky or Bartok or Prokofiev have. And I don't in any sense want to sort of suggest that those latter group of composers are any less modern. Mm. In fact, some, in some senses more so than the second Viennese school. Um, and you could trace a different sort of history through the 20th century, which uh, is certainly focused on lots of very innovatory uh, developments. Um, I mean, was obviously with Debussy, as you mentioned, um, but which I don't, I don't believe ultimately uh, give up on some form of tonal organization. And I don't believe Debussy does. We were saying about Wagner or Hugo Wolf. I think for momentary periods they go off directions, but I think uh, it's still ultimately clear. Well, the, the, I, I think even in Charles Ives that's hmm. the case as well. Well, the harmony is is fundamentally triadic in nature most of the time, <clears throat> even though it, it may not be obvious how the modulatory scheme works and how it might all relate to a, cent a central tonality. Uh, but something, something along those lines, having an extended tonality that is fundamentally centered around, around 
triads is probably that might be the marker. But then again, it, it's it's very complicated. It's, it's it's terribly difficult to parse it all out because a lot of the harmony in Opus Eleven is triadic. Uh, if you if you look at the chords, but modified triads um, with added notes that sort of preclude them from for, from fulfilling the usual triadic functions. Yes, but Scriabin, you know, it, it's it's tricky. It's tricky. Yes, but it's more directional in Scriabin, I think. It depends. Some of those pieces are quite static in their harmonic effect, I would argue. Um, well, I'm, I, th- I'm thinking of the o- opening of the Eighth Sonata, for example. Um, that's a mod- just a modified cadence in A, I think, for all the high amount of chromaticism. Um, it's still got this basic cadential function working underneath it. Um, look at the beginning of the 10th sonata. It starts with essentially outlining um, an augmented triad on G flat, and then that moves down to um, an E flat minor triad. Um, that to me is uh, just a certain type of uh, cadence from the third to the first degree as a scale, um, as on, on, in terms of the bass line. There, um, it's not now. But then, if I say, look at one of the most tonal of Schoenberg's early atonal works, being the Opus Eleven, Number Two. Um, so. For any listening to this who don't know this piece, it starts with an oscillating F and D in the bass and a lower F, uh, an octave below the higher one, um, which, you know, could very simply imply a D minor harmony. But then when the melody comes above that, it's quite, it goes from D flat to uh, A and then down a tritone to E flat, then up a fourth to (coughs) A flat, and then back down a tritone to D. But inevitably, that D naturalism there sounds to me like a resolution. Yes. And when I'm hearing the other chromatic notes, they're just implying a resolution that's going to come. Now, they, they imply now Schoenberg a, a, does this, but sometimes he holds back or doesn't even yeah. resolve. But. No, clearly. Uh, well, I would argue that that principle is, is operative to a greater or lesser degree in a lot of the works, where the E-flat sounds like a flat supertonic. Yeah. More or less, it's the same in the in the slow movement of the fourth quartet to a degree. It, it seems to, have, which coincidentally also sounds like it's in D minor. Uh, so it's a question of degree. But I still, I'm not convinced by the idea that that is the level on which these works are fundamentally challenging for audiences. It may have to do with the 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 rate of change, with the the constant onslaught of new chromatic pitches, the the harmonic rhythm. Uh, the harmonic rhythm in the Rite of Spring is is drastically slowed down. Yes. In comparison. And we know Schoenberg didn't like repetition. And this might be a key thing here. Um, it, yes, there's a sort of information overload. Well, if you take a work like uh, De Stadt by Andreessen, you have rhythmic patterns that are obvious and easy to hear. You have tonal patterns that are obvious and easy to hear. The harmonic rhythm is extremely slow. You have gestures and contrasts uh, that form very clear and simple formal markers in the piece. It's hypnotic, it's repetitive, and so on. Um, it's not obvious to me that De Stadt is a, is a more popular work than the fourth string quartet of Schoenbeck. Maybe it is, but I don't know that that's the level on which... Do you see what I mean? It, it's uh-huh. it's, it's no, tricky. It, it's tricky. Mean. I think... I think we'd need some empirical data for this. Uh, we'd need <laughs> to tricky. sort of play some audiences, uh, both the works, and then gauge their responses to them. Um, there might be some who are quite conservative listeners who think the Schoenberg sounds quite sort of refined, mm. uh, and whereas they think the Andreessen's all a bit too noisy and riotous to right. them. That's right, right. very possible. But I mean, you, I think you could say the same about the Rite of Spring as well. Um, well, I tried an experiment with my students when I was teaching at uh, the conservatory in Cambrai in northern France. And I had some younger students in that class. We were doing a course on musical analysis. And the idea was to, was to alternate uh, 20th century works with more established classical works. 
So we were looking at late Romanticism. We were looking at things like Wagner and, and Mahler and so on. And then one week I brought in the, the, um, the five orchestral pieces by Schoenberg. And we listened to them. And to the students, it wasn't immediately obvious that the, the, the tonal organization of that work was in some fundamental manner all that different from a more chromatic example, say, from Liszt or, or, or Wagner. Now, that kind of surprised me. I wasn't expecting that reaction, but it was, in fact, repeated multiple times. And uh, if, I, if I asked them to say, well, which, which work is tonal and which work is, is non-tonal, it wasn't necessarily categorically obvious to them. How well-versed in the standard repertoire would those students have been? Well, they were younger, so presumably their exposure to the repertoire w would have been limited, I imagine. They would have probably been centering themselves around a, a, a small number of works that they were attempting to master on their instruments. I don't get the sense that they would go home and listen to 10 symphonies a day. So not really immersed in the tradition? No. Because this prints an interesting sort of comparison to something that um, my friend, the musicologist Ava Moreda Rodriguez, was telling me that... She was teaching to some students uh, some ideas coming from the new musicology out of the work from the 90s, particularly about queer musicology and how some works of Schubert and Tchaikovsky have been analysed in terms of their particular harmonic patterns and their structural organisations as a quite alternative model of tonal organisation to the dominant one coming from Beethoven and so on, um, which I think is actually quite a sort of powerful explanation that... I mean, whether this maps onto sexuality, I think, is open to question. But there's no doubt to me that Tchaikovsky's approach to writing a symphony was quite fundamentally different to Beethoven's. Um, and at the very least, uh, these paradigms have gone some way to explaining how that that organisation is is considerably different. And particularly the 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 substitution of more th more relationships between. Uh, Harmonic relationships based upon thirds rather than fifths uh, is quite a fundamental thing found there. Um, and so it's as a way of bypassing some of the clear sort of dominant, dominant tonic opposition, which is still so fundamental in Beethoven, as you can see in those endless 5-1 alternations at the end of some of the symphonies, for example. But apparently this was lost on a lot of the students. They just said, oh, that all sounds like classical music. <laughs> right. Um, the the difference the differences between Beethoven and Tchaikovsky was probably something akin to the narcissism of small differences. Uh, it was a world that at, at most they saw from the perspective of an outsider, and maybe it's possible now if you take the Schoenberg uh, uh, five orchestral pieces that you know those are still composed using an orchestral idiom in terms of the use of the instruments uh, that's now well established, uh, has been much imitated or much drawn upon, um, and itself uh, you can quite clearly link to some of that that you find in Wagner and Richard Strauss and in others. Um, I mean, Schoenberg takes it in new directions, but it belongs within a tradition there. Um, and, and other as aspects of of texture, of rhythm, of density. Um, these these things certainly overlap to a large degree uh, with lots of other works in the tradition. And so I'm wondering if when, when the whole music is not something that's become second nature, when, when, the, when the tradition's not become second nature to students, whether the things that we see as crucial differences and not yet mm. so apparent, but maybe with a greater degree of familiarity, they would become. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, there's a there's a quote. You'll probably know who this poet is, which is, "When the lights are dim, all cats be grey." <laughs> if you if you don't have enough illumination to to see uh, to see distinctions between things, then everything, of course, looks the same to you. Yeah. But still, that just the. The relative lack of differentiation, I'm not sure that's any signifier that um, this is going to generate amongst these sorts of less tutored minds a new new sort of enthusiasm for Schoenberg orchestral music. Um, but I might be wrong on that. Um, 
what I'm trying to say here, at least an article I read just very recently, uh, which, okay, to put it in a nutshell, it's saying if you lose a classical tradition, uh, you'll lose contemporary classical music as well, which I think is accurate. Um, I think ultimately the audiences for, well, I still like the term new music, which comes, which is something I date back to about 1918. The audiences for that, um, those who would pursue that music, uh, or a lot of it with, uh, with real sort of sustained enthusiasm will come from those, uh, who are also used to grappling with the intricacies and the complexities of music in the Western classical tradition. Um, now that's a quite unfashionable position to take nowadays, and it's far from uncommon to find amongst composers uh, a view that, no, this music has to sort of get away from that tradition, and the new audiences are to be found amongst those who listen to more popular music or jazz or things like that. To which I'd say, A, I don't think, I haven't yet seen much evidence of that process happening on any sustained level. There are odd cases for sure, but... Um, I think but, what, I, what, I, what I'm trying to establish is that the, 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 the differences for, let's say, a non-specialized audience between late list, for example, Wagner, Schoenberg... Bartok, Debussy are comparatively minor. They're, they're not. They're not colossal differences in in, in the sense that it, they might reveal themselves to a to a, a more well versed or, or specialized listener. But so so my my argument is that that's fundamentally not where this breakdown seems to occur. Uh, I think that that happens in the post war era, and I think it has possibly partly to do with stylistic matters, but. Not exclusively. I think it has to do with the way the music is being uh, disseminated, uh, with the way that the composers may be addressing their audience or or not addressing it, their attitude towards the audience, and the the progressive entrenchment of the compositional tradition into academia and into things that are extremely distant, in fact, from uh, from the for want of a better term, from the from the quotidian concerns of everyday people. Uh, Schoenberg is certainly a radical figure within that tradition, but he's still within that tradition, very demon very demonstrably so. There isn't really a break, there's an acceleration, there's an intensification, there's a there's an increased degree of complexity, I suppose, but but there there isn't a categorical break. But I do think that occurs in the in the post-war era. Well one Explanation for this is the idea that essentially the Second Viennese School represent the end of a tradition. Um, and possibly you could extend it a bit further. Maybe Carter would belong with that. Maybe Vernier would belong within that. But uh, all sort of playing a type of end game. Um, music that strikes by seeing what's still possible uh, to do out of what's been inherited from that tradition rather than setting down... Um, blueprints for a whole new directions, which I think is what Stravinsky and Bartok and Prokofiev did. Um, so the response of those who wanted to build upon the achievements of the Second Viennese School um, was generally to strip it out from most of that sort of uh, early 20th century Viennese uh, expression that came with it and all the other trappings of tradition uh, that were there, which I think are absolutely defining to the music, in fact, more defining uh, than the than the serial organisation, in the case of the dodecaphonic works, I mean. Um, but in that... And yes, you're, you're right. Even, I mean, even in, in Stravinsky and Debussy and Prokofiev and so on, I mean, these... This music didn't come from nowhere. This wasn't sort of rip it up and start it again. Mm. Uh, you know, this, you can easily trace Stravinsky back to Remsky, Korsakov, to Mussorgsky, to Tchaikovsky, um, and uh, and and some senses to Italian opera and to some French music and so on. You can easily trace Prokofiev back to similar things. Um, 
for those familiar with that sort of period in French music that's perhaps least well known in between the death of Berlioz and the first mature works of Debussy, so in the 1870s and 1880s, uh, the period right after the Franco-Prussian War, when you see important works of Faure, of Chabré, of Massenet, um, and others. Once you have a sort of degree of familiarity with that tradition, then it's not so difficult to see where Debussy comes from, combined with influences from Russian music and from Wagner and elsewhere. That I mean, these were radical composers. They, um, they moved music on by quite palpable degree, but it didn't come out of nowhere. Um, but nor did nor did Bulez, nor did Stockhausen. Uh, they didn't come out of nowhere. Bul I mean, Bulez, uh, in at least in time, became quite explicit about this. Uh, how much he felt that what had been achieved by Debussy, by Bartok, by Stravinsky, by Schoenberg, by Berg, was there to build uh, by Varese as well. Was there to build on, uh, whilst rejecting some aspects of it as well. Um, and I've probably said to you before how I do, I'll do. i never accept the Stundenall theory of new music after 1945. Uh, it, first of all, because actually in terms of what was being predominantly written and performed after 1945, in no sense constituted a, a Stundenall. But could, could you lay out what that means for our listeners? Sorry, Stundenall, zero hour in Germany. Um, it's a theory of history which is treated with a lot of scepticism by historians of the period now. But it's the idea that essentially uh, Germany had been destroyed, reduced to rubble, and everything had to start again from first principles. Um, and that this would happen in music and culture, that the whole, the languages inherited from the past had been thoroughly discredited by their associations with Nazism. And so something new that uh, broke with these completely had to be created in its place. Um, well, that doesn't account for a figure like Hensel. No, it certainly doesn't. Nor for at least up until the late 1950s, the figures that were extremely dominant in German new music, who were people like, well, like Karl Orff for a start, mm -hmm. like Wolfgang Fortner, like Werner Eck, mm -hmm. like Boris Blacker. Mm -hmm. Hindemith. Uh, uh, Hindemith very much so, yes, uh, even though he was out of the country, but he, he was being played a lot. Um, and younger figures, including Hans Werner Hense, uh, and one that's now pretty much forgotten, but was very big, Gisela Kleber, um, who was getting commissioned here, there, and everywhere. And someone like Stockhausen uh, and the slightly younger uh, figures uh, such as um, such as Hans Otter or such as Dieter Schnabel, just a couple of years younger than Stockhausen. Uh, these people were very much on the margins. And Otter found his way through writing music that was essentially like his teacher Hindemith for a while before in the 60s he moved into a more sort of... Um, aleatory music uh, and more radical uh, idioms there. Um, I mean, my, po my point is the avant-garde was on the margins throughout uh, most of the early po post-war period. Um, it was through the influence of people like Herbert Eimert, who had a very important position at Cologne Radio um, and was something of an avant-gardist himself uh, that managed to push things so that by the time not earlier than the early 60s, um, some of the avant-garde was starting to move more into the mainstream there. But, I mean, that, that was to explain that the, I, I don't believe Stunden... If there had been a Stundenall, you would have had very few of those other tendencies. This, this meaning the, zero hour, yes, we should probably... Yeah. Yes, zero hour. But f that zero hour model, which informed quite a bit of the historiography of new music. This is something I'm writing about at the moment, particularly the stuff published in the 70s and 80s, um, presented this as a new language had to be built up from first principles, almost literally from elementary particles. And integral serialism, pointless music, seem, uh, maps onto that sort of metaphor very well, because you can see individual notes, which uh, somehow removed from any of the previous functional relationships that they might have had, uh, form the particles of the new music, and then new types of macroscopic organisation, especially as you find in something like Stockhausen's Gruppen, uh, enable ways of developing a more sophisticated language out of this. 
Um, well, I, I certainly, I certainly agree that it's far too simplistic to ascribe the the Second World War as the moment in which everything fundamentally shifts permanently, and that there's no recovering it. I think that's that's far too simplistic. Uh, nevertheless, it, it clearly accelerated certain forces that were perhaps already operative before that period, um, and you could perhaps say, say that this we're we're at the perhaps the end of a very long historical process that's been playing out over 100, 150 years. But nevertheless, there is, for me, a categorical difference between where we are now with the manner in which a composer may interface with their their audience versus uh, what was the case in the time of Schoenberg. I think that it's, it's, it's a categorical difference. It's no longer a matter of degree. If you go from one generation to the next, you can say, well, it's, you know, if you compare the attitude of a Schoenberg versus Boulez, for example, you can say, well, it's not a, it's not a complete break. There are still some common features. But if you were to jump three generations or four generations and then compare, then I think it would be increasingly difficult to see any sense of affiliation, any sense of connection by that point. And, and my, I suppose my argument now is that the a figure like Schoenberg, although obviously his music is, is radical and it's, uh, uh, it was in its time and continues to be for many people an alienating language. Nevertheless, his his intention, his aim, which you can easily trace in the music, was not fundamentally different from the attitude of a, of a Beethoven who wants to address everybody fundamentally. The language in which he's doing so may be rebarbative, it may be challenging, but that's his, I believe that's his fundamental aspiration. It's his hope that the work will eventually find its audience, it will eventually be comprehensible, and it will speak to humanity in the broadest sense. I simply don't believe that for a lot of composers working today, that is their that is their ambition. And I don't believe that they believe that that's even something that one can aspire to today. Now, obviously, you could, you could say I'm making a bit of a paper tiger out of these figures, I'm not citing names, but as a general phenomenon, my sense is that the expectations that that artists have today, in terms of what might be possible to do, are significantly lower. Yes, I think that's true, but I'm not completely sure if I agree with you on how similar Schoenberg and Beethoven were in that respect. I mean, Schoenberg did still say, if it's for all, then it's not art. Um, I'm not sure on what basis the evidence is that Schoenberg really was intending, or at least imagining, that he was going to write a music that would uh, that would speak to all people. I mean, it's often that thing that he apparently said to Josef Rufer about I've uh, I've I've come across a new technique that will sustain German music for another hundred years. Those two, uh, th- those that, two, that, that, sta- he probably didn't say that. No, but those two statements are in contradiction to to one another, and I, I don't. You have to be careful with the proclamations of composers. Yes, it's, sure. It's not. It's not self evident. Self serving. It's not self evident that he actually believed that. When he when he would say, for example, if it's if it's art, it's not for everybody, and if it's for everybody, it's not for art. I don't know that he necessarily believed that. Maybe he did, but you have to look at the work and what the work is aiming to do. Um, I'm not I'm not utterly convinced by that. Well, how about if I put it a slightly different way? I say, Schoenberg was aiming to write music whose greatness he thought would ultimately be realized by all, but that didn't mean that all would want to listen to it. Right, right. Whereas I think Beethoven did imagine probably most of those who thought it was great would want to listen to it as well. Even the late string quartets, the gross of Maybe not by that stage, um, but that's quite exceptional within his own output. Even within his late output, where, it's just Charles Rosen shows very well, how to some extent he actually returns to some of the more strict formal models uh, from his earlier work, uh, in comparison to some of the, the late mid-period works where he's pushing the boundaries of form all the more. Um, even the Hammerklavier Sonata, the first movement, is in a quite strict traditional sonata form in many ways, more so than some of the other sonatas that surround it. Um, so, you know, he was... But th- that's the sort of thing I'd link to a whole phenomenon within certain types of modernism that were about expanding resources but also reinscribing a certain sort of new formal discipline as well and you can find that across the arts um 
You well, know, he's especially in architecture, you find that there's a, there's a deep classicizing strain in most of the modern movement, I would say. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, they were in some ways reacting against um, late romantic excess. Um, and the same is true, I think, in a lot of music as well. Uh, the this is where you know the 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 model that well, it's actually Richard Taruskin has developed it, developed it a lot, though it draws upon lots of others before him of this period of maximalism between around eighteen ninety till around till around nineteen eighteen in music where you see the most opulent, extravagant works of Strauss, of Schoenberg, of the earlier Ravel, um, and of lots of other figures, um, which contrasts so strongly with this paring down and narrowing of resources. I mean, well, early Stravinsky would fall into that mode as well. But then when you hear works like the Octet of Stravinsky, um, you know, you're almost listening to a different composer. I mean, with... With real familiarity, one could see the commonalities between the two things. But in terms of the idiom, in terms of the style, uh, all of that ostentation has gone. And you can see this in, to a slight, not quite an extreme degree, but in Ravel's work, um, uh, before and after around the sort of uh, mid-1910s, the sort of world of Gaspard or of Daphnis is such a different idiom from that. You find it something like the... Violin sonata or L'Enfant les Sautes Though he returns to a bit of it in the left hand concerto. That's why I say it's not quite so extreme, the the gap there. But that's that's why I've always thought of nineteen eighteen as being the really crucial turning point. It's it's reinscribing a cleaner and more objective, if you like, and more disciplined music, uh, to get away from the excesses of expression. And that's if you follow the debates amongst uh, the sort of German aestheticians of the left during the 20s, that's very clear. Um, between between the advocates of expressionism, of which Ernst Bloch and to some extent Adorno were probably uh, the last true advocates, uh, and then all the much more common ideas around the Neuzaklik guide, and then later on... The new objectivity, uh, yes. right. Mm -hmm. um, and if anything, the new objectivity was maybe new in Germany. It wasn't so new in France. Um, that's you know at least at least as far back as the early Satie, you see that sort of break certainly with the Wagnerian model. I know Debussy broke with the Wagnerian model as well, but not as drastically as Satie did. I, th I think once again, I think this this is a progressive uh, tendency that you can that you see that's been playing out for for decades. We may be in the end stages of it. I don't know. It's it's hard to have the requisite uh, distance and objectivity to look at these things properly. But all I can see is, judging from the indications that I can I can observe from people who are outside of the new music world, it certainly appears to be the case that as a cultural force, as something that may, in some manner, contribute to shaping our culture, and you could certainly argue that there's a kind of a trickle down effect where it doesn't reach the ears of most people but nevertheless it 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 does eventually find its way down into something that uh, that would be more uh, accessible or popular in in nature uh, but that that as a cultural force it's basically spent it's the game is over and nobody's listening except for interested parties professional artists uh, the people who attend festivals such as Dono Eschingen and Darmstadt who tend to be music professionals uh, but outside of that, there's no, to use your term, there's no wider resonance from the vast majority of the production of new music. And that is the that is the indication I'm getting from, from people outside of that. Now, these are not Philistines. These are not uneducated people. Uh, they are, uh, in many instances, extraordinarily cultivated, well-versed in culture, extremely well-read, very familiar with classical music. And this is the... This is what I'm hearing. Well, there are three things that come to mind in the context of all that you're saying there. The first is to ask whether the idea of a, of a new music cultural sphere, which 
seems to sort of uh, communicate only within its own realms to groups of aficionados who go along to festivals, a lot of them with professional involvement in that scene, to ask really how new that is. I mean, if you read a lot about the festivals, and there were many in the 1920s, but of which probably the best the best known now is that in Donaueschingen, then later in Baden-Baden and Berlin. Um, I've read enough about the reception of the concerts there and wider commentary about festival culture to see many of the same sorts of sentiments being expressed then. Um, a concern that new music was sort of painting itself into a corner, uh, was obsessed with certain types of experiment uh, over and above the challenges of writing something that might have some wider currency. And, well, it's quite interesting. If we look back at the programmes from Don and Gun, I mean, how many sight op uh, are known nowadays? Whatever happened to those sort of radio compositions that people, even including Hindemith, wrote? Uh, or, I mean, actually, many many of the figures there, I mean, who listens to Heinz Thiessen mm. or Ernst Tock, except perhaps the geographical fugue nowadays? Even a figure like Stefan Volper is really very much a composer, um, appreciated within a narrow circle, but not that much outside of there. But you did see things like new works of Bartok being played at these festivals as well, and those have made their way into some sort of wider repertoire. So I I am in time going to be writing a new history of musical modernism in the Weimar Republic, and it strikes me how little of the German composers of that time are heard with any frequency nowadays. Hindemith's reputation is nothing like it was when I was younger, let alone what it was in the 50s. Um, certainly the Second Viennese School are played, uh, but even even that's within... I mean, I think probably most musicians have, have encountered some of their work, but it hasn't really achieved a wider currency. But that to one side, Kurt Weill's work has definitely had a lasting impression. You don't often hear that of Ernst Krenek nowadays. Uh, you don't hear Toch, you don't hear Thiessen, you don't hear Max Butting, um, and any Philip Janak, uh, any number of other people who were uh, uh, who were really quite sort of uh, prominent figures in the 20s and 30s uh, in Germany um, and now pretty much forgotten. Um, but maybe that's... Uh, quite inevitable. I could think of any number of 19th century figures for whom the same could be said. Uh, and maybe if just a few things come out of this festival circuit and go on to continue to be listened to, that in itself is as much as we might reasonably hope for. So it might be a bit premature to say that what's being played in the new music uh, infrastructure is the term I like to use for it. The network of festivals, of concert series, of radio stations and programmes, uh, and some educational institutions and journals and things as well. What is known in that? Um, to say that it, it has little wider currency, doesn't register outside of that, may not be so new, and I think we shouldn't wholly rule out the possibility that might be a few things uh, that do. That's the first point, but my other points might sort of slightly temper that. Uh, the second point uh, I really think is important to bear in mind, when you compare music with other cultural forms, with literature, with the visual arts, with, um, with film and television, um, with dance as well, and theatre, I don't think in any of the others is a quite as much of a chasm between the popular and the high art form as exists in music. You can trace that back to Wagner, if not earlier. Yes, certainly. But I think it became especially pronounced in the in the twentieth century. I mean, what perhaps hasn't really existed on any sustain to any sustained degree since figures like Britton and Shostakovich say is, or Karl Amadeus Hartmann would be another, is a sustained tradition of music which somehow 
I don't want I really don't want to use the term middle brow because I dislike it. I don't think that's a very fair term for those composers. I don't think those composers are any less sort of serious or necessarily any less demanding than some of their more avant-garde counterpoints. But they are working comfortably from within a tradition without radic without engaging any sort of radically iconoclastic activity there. And as such, it's not such a leap from uh, an interest in that tradition to uh, to an interest in their work. Well, you uh, might be able to cite figures such as such as John Adams, for example, Philip Glass, perhaps, uh, to a limited degree, George Benjamin. Although I, I would yes. I, I would situate him much more in the in the new music realm than, than in anything resembling what uh, what Benjamin Britten uh, achieved. Uh, which is, of course, not a not a commentary on the achievement of George Benjamin, but simply to point out that he's 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 not. He doesn't have that level of cultural penetration or uh, of accessibility in, in his work. Um, but then you could say, well, you could, the counter argument could say, well, yes, but a figure such as Glass, for example, is not as composition compositionally accomplished. The, the music is not of as high quality as a lot of the output of of bit of Britain, and um, it, it's it's tricky to find any kind of figure who would be who would be comparable or, or analogous in any way whatsoever to someone like that, I would argue. Well, Satie, perhaps? Satie? Why so? <sighs> Using very sort of uh, limited and delimited compositional resources uh, towards a particular end. I mean, in terms of what you're saying, Glass being less accomplished as a composer in Britain, I'm not. I'm not making that argument. I'm, I'm sorry. It's, it's a devil's advocate position. Yeah, I mean, because because I'm not. Sh I'm not sure that would be easy to justify as an argument. Uh, um, I mean, we could say that the, a large amount of Morton Feldman's music is quiet. So he showed he could write quiet music, but he wasn't so good at the mezzo forte or the fortissimo. But that would be a really facile argument. Uh, I think because some composers have uh, s stuck within limited realms doesn't make them any any less accomplished than those who've done broader things. I mean, I know Stockhausen once criticised composers and it's thought he might have had people like Ligeti or Zanakis or Fellman in mind who said, if you want to make a big name, do something like become the snare drum composer. Yes, that's right. Yes. <laughs> uh, that's, right. that's in the Robin McCorney book, I yes, believe. Yeah. Um, yeah. So... Okay, now I, I appreciate you're saying that as a devil's advocate argument rather than as your as your own one. And I think it, it is true to say that Glass and Adams and Reich and others have achieved a genuine penetration to a wider public sphere uh, in some ways, perhaps more so than some more some uh, more canonical figures. Uh, uh, but that's that's a very particular direction, and it's not one I want to denigrate by any means. Um, I might have harsher things to say about some of the propaganda surrounding it, whether coming from the composers or their advocates, and also about the historiography which I've written about, uh, which sort of posits that uh, everything was going to pot in new music, and then these people came along and saved their ass, saved its ass, mm -hmm. as it were. And I, I dislike that sort of rhetoric, um, even expressed in slightly less crude terms. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that work stands quite outside of the classical tradition in many ways. Well, Feldman, char Sorry? Feldman characterized it as showbiz. He, he was saying he doesn't take Philip Glass seriously because he's in showbiz. He's not a he's not a composer. Which you know you don't have to take that seriously as a remark. But well, wasn't Kurt Weill in showbiz? Very literally. <laughs> Um, and I'd say he was a very serious composer. And I don't just mean his early works, I mean all the way up to his American musicals. Um, um, when I wrote my big two-part article on the historiography of minimal music, I posited that there are three, because I don't think minimal music represents uh, a drastic a drastic break. Uh, I think it does represent a break with a lot of Central European traditions, but it has a clear lineage, and it's sort of one branch coming out of several roots, and those roots include music of Satie above all, uh, the earlier music of Stravinsky, especially of Le Sacre and Linos. Um, and then, and this is the argument that comes out of... Uh, 
the work of Wim Mertens, who wrote one of the early books on minimal music, that it actually comes out of integral serialism in a way. And the figure of Heuwerts, who bridges those two worlds, demonstrates that. Also the fact that um, Lamont Young's early work can be seen like a sort of expansion of Feldman onto a vast... If an expansion of Webern mm. onto a, onto a vast cam, canvas as well. Um, that relationship is more complex and difficult. But then within the traditions bequeathed by those roots, I would include Feldman's music or Christian Wolf's music on one hand. I would include, uh, say, some of the work of Nicholas R. Huber or Ernst Albrecht Stiebler using very limited resources or some aspects of music spectral as well. All those different branches coming out of a fundamental aesthetic of relative stasis, um, which rejects this particular dynamic and dialectical approach to composition. Well, there's this an interesting article actually by Jonathan Harvey that deals with that topic. And his contention is that this is the inevitable heritage of the Webernian project, which is of having a, a harmony that's completely unmoored from any kind of a bass function. Or rather, as he puts it, the, the bass has, has moved up into the middle register, but it's no longer determining the harmony. You might, I think that was published in, in Contact. You probably have, have read that article. Um, and that in, in consequence, because of this absence of gravity, so to speak, uh, in, in the harmony, then it forces you, in a sense, to have a, 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 a significantly slowed down harmonic rhythm. And that leads to, or, or to a stasis of, of some kind, effectively. The music no longer is, is oriented or, or grounded. Uh, and that leads you to, to things like the Feldman pieces. Uh, but that's not the only example. I could trace that sort of unanchored music, if you like, that horizontally focused music, back to such things as uh, the publications of books on linear counterpoint by Ernst Kurt in 1917 and the whole new lease of life that that sort of thought gave to a music uh, that was about line rather than about harmony as well. Uh, that's before some of uh, Weben's ma major essays in that sort of genre. But that's that sort of thinking, which is on one hand radical, on the other hand quite conservative, because it's really looking back to a time before the 19th century, before harmony comes to sort of take precedence over counterpoint and harmony comes to be taught first uh, towards an idea that counterpoint is at the root of things and harmony is at most a byproduct of that. Um, but it's using that to a radical end towards uh, the construction of music, which isn't sort of formed around some tonal principles which you can still say of relatively modal counterpoint, uh, at least in the equal temperament era. Okay, you, you, you seem to be arguing, Ian, that the, the points that I've raised in terms of how the present moment, in terms of musical production, seems to me to be fundamentally different from the way it would have been 50 or 60 years ago. Uh, not, you know, that's not even to go back uh, any farther than that. Uh, you seem to be arguing that for many of the points that I'm raising, there are historical precedents for it. There's a yeah. there is a degree of connectedness. There's nothing fundamentally exceptional about the about the present moment. No, I wouldn't quite say that. I think there are differences to the present moment that I was coming on to when I mentioned about sort of the relationship to popular music, which is something I would loosely trace back to the early 19th century. Uh, it's an urban music fundamentally associated with the growth of larger cities and so on. And it takes forms of things such as music hall or cafe concert or cabaret or vaudeville in the 19th century, then through to traditions of ragtime, blues, uh, and early jazz and so on. But it really comes together I think I would say in the 40s rather than the mid-50s. Mid-50s is commonly the date given for the sort of beginning of rock and roll. But I would say it comes together with the beginning of rhythm and blues uh, as a really established genre in New Orleans at the beginning of the 40s, uh, which is exactly the point that Fats Domino was very keen to point out to some um, some interviewer who asked him in the mid-50s, tell me about this new music called Rock and Roll you're playing. He says, I call it Rhythm and Blues and I've been playing it in New Orleans since 1940. Um, so I think it's around that time that something really comes together that forms a truly lasting tradition which gains a very uh, 
wide currency and even a global currency in in time to come. And that's a huge thing for uh, an art music tradition to compete with. Uh, and I think more so than, let's say, literary fiction uh, does with compared to popular fiction. Uh, the chasm's not so great between them. Perhaps if uh, we were talking only about that literature that produces, makes radical experiments with form, for example, say, well, some of the literature of Samuel Beckett, the work of B.S. Johnson, um, or figures like Eva Figus or Christine Brooke Rose or that sort of thing. There, the that's a, that's probably about as far away from um, fr uh, fr from from popular fiction as you could get. Same in cinema. If you were looking at a very experimental film, what of Stan Brakhage or Bill Viola or something like that, uh, and you were to compare that with Jurassic Park, then there's a big chasm. But if you were to compare, say, um, the in very intelligent but films but made for a mainstream audience like say those of Martin Scorsese with uh, some of the more populist inclined things of George Lucas and Steven Spielberg um, I don't think there's anything like the same sort of total uh, difference of intent and means and everything there but that's that there's it's very hard for me to think of uh, a composer who's equivalent to someone like Scorsese in cinema um and that's in no sense to call Scorsese a middle-brow filmmaker. I think he's a very, very great filmmaker throughout his career. Um, but he has worked within basically narrative-oriented structures. Um, he's done very imaginative things with all aspects of of the cinema, all aspects of how you use cuts, how you use edits of other types, how you use the camera work, uh, everything like that, how you use music, actually, everything like that. But... In, in ways that are meaningful to a mainstream audience. I, I think I, you'd have to look in the popular music sphere to find a yes a, an equivalent figure. I, I don't think you'd find it in the composition world. Yes, or um, maybe in the jazz sphere, something like Coltrane's A Love Supreme might be comparable mm -hmm. in a way that something like Cecil Taylor's unit structures wouldn't, mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. um, if, that, if that makes sense. Uh, so, I, so I think... Uh, the competition from popular culture uh, is of a different uh, order of magnitude. Um, I mean, I mean, also, also just simply uh, the global reach of it. I mean, how much does that much popular fiction, other than perhaps J.K. Rowling and a few others, uh, when she was more in vogue than she is now, um, how much popular fiction gets a truly maybe Dan Brown as well uh, gets a truly global audience, like you could say of a quite a significant amount of popular music as well probably even less so with theatre mm -hmm. as well so and you know a thing I notice in academia you can I mean when you talk about cultured people again I come I come across people who know huge amounts about literature uh, huge amounts about society and politics uh, lots about the visual arts but you mention something like a D major scale to them and they really think this is you know, you might as well be talking about sort of advanced astrophysics. Or right, something. right, right. Uh, <laughs> um, but I don't think that would have been the case. And this is this was my third point. I was coming out. I don't think that would have been the case thirty or forty years ago. I think a lot of people who'd, a lot of educated people would have had some exposure to at least some basics of music theory and some basics of a Western classical musical tradition. And that's that's is disappearing. I think uh, it's particularly about here in Britain and particularly about in the US. But from all I can tell, it's sort of being marginalised out in lots of other countries as well, perhaps at a slightly different rate. Okay. Um, and one of the consequences of this is that I'm... Well, I think I still think even some of the most radical work in new music in some sense has meaning relative to a tradition including some of that stuff like Helmut Lackermann or Maurizio Cargill that in the sense is turning that tradition on its head. But you need to know what that tradition is to recognise it being turned on its head. Um, the I, I've heard from 
regularly, perhaps a bit too often, from young composers. Uh, they think that the classical tradition is dead, or they want it to be dead, perhaps. Uh, I mean, in some universities, I think they don't want to have to, their own music have to compete with that for student interest and favour. But some of some contemporary composers have played an active uh, role in trying to sort of uh, push that Western classical tradition out of the curriculum um, in a way that I think is often very destructive. What do you think is their motivation for doing that? Well, as I say, on one hand, I think they want to have the ground to themselves for a certain sort of art music, uh, if you like. Um, and if they're just one composer amongst a great many spanning centuries, then they're a much smaller fish in a much bigger pond. Do you think there are contemporary authors who are anxious about having their work compete with Shakespeare? Not to the same extent. Um, because composers routinely... I know this because I have I work with so many students. They they imagine themselves as being in potentially in the same room as Beethoven and then not measuring up. But I don't I don't see a lot of poets thinking now hang on a minute this is this is not as good as the Shakespearean sonnets. Well cuz I I think there is an audience for contemporary literature. I say not the most radical experimental stuff I was mentioning, but a lot of uh artistic literature, if you like, um, which is not in its own right, which doesn't necessarily, those who read it don't necessarily have the same amount invested in at least sort of classics from before the 19th century. I think that's possible. I think the same is true in theatre as well, and possibly in the visual arts, so it's a bit more complex there. Um, I'm... I've not yet seen evidence that the same is true for new music. There's a few people. There's a few people who who might like some progressive rock and some Zappa or something and then come from that into Stockhausen. Yes, I've known that happen, but I think that's quite exceptional. Um, there isn't the same... Constituency has, say, many who might read a novel of Martin Amis or something or Michel Roelbeck, uh, but wouldn't necessarily uh, be that drawn to reading Daniel Defoe or reading Cervantes. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think that's there, or I haven't seen it in music. And so when, I, when I'm saying about those in universities who are pushing the sort of vo take the dead white European males off the curriculum, and there are plenty of these... I think they're ultimately, to some extent, digging their own grave mm. here. Because if they... Well, what, what the, the second part of that means, get rid of the dead white males in order to make room for me. That, that's, yes, that's yes, exactly. The, and some, sometimes it's just living white males. The only, right. the only way they differ is they're not dead. But unfortunately, we all will be in the end. Um, Which posits that there's a zero-sum game, effectively. Yes, uh, yes, there is. Um, but if... I mean, I really wish some contemporary composers would think more about this. If you didn't have uh, some sort of weight of tradition, which in some sense informs and gives somewhere to locate your work, if you're actually just having to compete on its own terms with popular music, do you think it was you stand a chance? Mm. Um, I hear lots of stuff about saying, oh, we have different modes of distribution. Now anyone can produce things on a laptop. And you can produce a lot with a laptop, and especially now with some of the latest AI software for composition, which I've looked at and has other sorts of new implications. Uh, there is a lot you can do in that respect. Um, but how do you get anyone to listen to it? Anyone can do something, put it out on SoundCloud, or Spotify, or well, something like yes. that. But uh, but that's just as true of, of popular uh, genres as it is of oh, more, yes, more sure. esoteric ones. It's, it's not as though it's any easier to uh, to emerge from nothing and make a gigantic career for yourself as a singer songwriter. Oh, I know, and it's and all of his just is getting harder and harder uh, in the popular field to make any sort of impact uh, when there are so many other people trying to do it. Uh, is everything, and there might be all sorts of factors which the small number who come from this and actually gain some sort of wider recognition, which is why it's a huge mistake and it's disingenuous when you get sort of 
when you get things like the Greek authors of Promises that think if you study popular music that you'll this will give you a route towards a great a well-paying career yeah. uh, for everyone everyone you see every popular musician you see who is doing that there are any number of others who've done a handful of gigs in small venues and then just sort of split up uh. nevertheless my intuitive sense having been in the new music world i'm not really sure if i'm in it anymore but perhaps i am it's hard to say is that <laughs> there, there's there's something either fundamentally broken or exhausted about that culture today. I don't know which. I don't know if it's repairable. I don't know if it ought to be repaired. But the sense I get attending concerts, and, and this could partly be a reflection of my being a little bit older now. So, of course, it feels different to attend a concert when you're 42, as I am now, as opposed to when you're 22. The excitement level is perhaps not the same because you've seen several hundred concerts in the intervening years. But it certainly seems to me as though something has changed. There, there's much less of a sense of anticipation or excitement surrounding these events. There's a sense uh, that the infrastructures that are supporting these sorts of uh, events is on very shaky ground, I would say, uh, that it, it may not be able to convincingly justify its own indefinite existence without some kind of massive change in the way that the, in the way that it's it's set up um, and that we cannot indefinitely push off into the future the question of well who's listening to it well future audiences well that doesn't work forever no it doesn't work forever and 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 then I'll just finish this with with, with one more point so there are pieces that I've heard that involve enormous orchestras playing extraordinarily esoteric techniques that require a great deal of specialized training that is not something you can count on with the vast majority of professional orchestras. You need a specialized new music orchestra to do that. Specialized new music orchestras are, of course, financially non-viable uh, unless they're being massively subsidized by the state. Uh, these works require enormously expensive rehearsals to produce, and they're typically played once. And this is not by any means an isolated phenomenon. It is, in fact, the standard mode of operating for the, most of the continental festivals. And the assumption seems to be that it's better to program only premieres, or, or by and large premieres. Let's say 90% of the, of the works will be premieres. And it seems to be almost a structural phenomenon that, of course, these works won't be played again. Or, or maybe they'll be dug up in 25 years. And, and, and dust it off. But in, in the vast majority of cases, works that cost hundreds of thousands of, of euros to put on, th there's no way that you can play them with any, anything like the frequency that would be required for them to be, become either familiar or to make any kind of an impression beyond the local audience of maybe a few hundred people that hears the premiere. So that, I think, I think that's got to stop. Or, or it, it simply will stop out of its own inertia and out of the the sheer financial absurdity of it. So, so if, if you were to compare something like that, a, a, a composition that takes two years to write, that requires a, a colossal budget in order to perform, and that can only be done once, that sounds to me like a non-starter. Compare that to a figure such as Vivian Meyer in the photography world. There we go. Vivian Meyer was a photographer who operated essentially in secret. She was a street photographer in Chicago who, for decades... Uh, took uh, uh, took square format images with a Rolleiflex camera on the streets of Chicago, produced something like 25,000 photographs. She was one of the finest street photographers of all time, never showed her work to anybody, never told anyone she was doing it. And when she died, all of these boxes of negatives were discovered by a film historian, and she became a, posthumously a, a phenomenon. But this work is done privately at no cost to anybody, except the cost of a, a film for her, uh, and ends up having a, a, a very significant popular impact when it's eventually discovered. So th there's, there's, a, there's a colossal asymmetry between the means required to produce these things versus the number of people that will actually benefit from that. Well, I think we do have to distinguish between the performing and non-performing arts in this respect. I mean, photography can essentially be done by a single person, I recognize sometimes you have other people doing prints and the negatives and so on. But uh, 
you don't require the whole apparatus of a group of performers to produce <laughs> photography. The same is true for literature as well. Um, whereas music or film or theatre or dance uh, are multi multi person activities, uh, and that's always going to be more expensive. Um, and this is one reason why, I say, what some people say about, well, why can't uh, the modern music world be like the modern art world, particularly in terms of the, the amounts of money that uh, that are made by some of the artists, uh, but they produce a particular thing that becomes a commodity. And but here's the thing, though, the, 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 in, the, the, in, in the popular sphere the amount of money that it costs to produce the thing is is scaled in terms of the number of people that it can potentially reach there's a coherence between those two things right so so if you make a film that has a 100 million pound budget for example then you're expecting to get a return on that you're expecting that it will draw at least 100 million in the box office so right so you could argue well there's no reason why that should apply to to the fine arts but uh Somebody does have to pay for it. You know, we, th there's no way to get around that fact. Oh, this this is what I've been banging on about for years, uh, a bit like a broken record, uh, that I think the possible decline of a subsidy culture for new music is one of the biggest threats it could possibly face. There is no way that the vast majority of new music, other than things like Reich and Glass and a few others, um, could survive just on the open marketplace. The costs are too great and the returns too low. Uh, the listenership is is too low, except for the odd few things that may... I mean, it's possible some orchestra could put a big Bert Whistle piece on within in the context of an otherwise more traditional programme and they'd still get enough people in that that would just about cover the costs of it. But those cases... Uh, um, well, and yes, with things like chamber music as well and solo performance where the costs aren't quite so great, it's also possible. Um, but on the whole, um, the vast majority of new music, as we understand it, at least in European terms, uh, only gets to be performed, only gets to be recorded uh, through support, through through state subsidies, so money collected through taxation and redistributed to make up for the shortfall, or through the radio stations or other, or, the, or other broadcasters who collect it through the license fee, or to some extent through the universities as well. Um, now, I mean, certainly in Britain, we've seen uh, sweeping cuts to arts funding, especially to music funding recently, the most prominent of which uh, released to English National Opera, which the, at the time we're talking, the idea is it could be re relocated in Manchester, but it almost certainly won't be the same sort of entity that it was before. Um, big grant losses to things like the Britain Symphonia, to the London Symphonietta, to the Ensemble Saffer in Manchester who have had to close down and so on and so forth. Um, and in economically difficult times, um, these things are seen as perhaps not the most pressing social needs and some of the easiest things to cut when cuts are made. Now, many have said to me, why are you always so concerned? Why are you always talking about subsidy? Uh, and they don't want to talk about it. They don't think it's a very interesting issue or something. I say, well, it, uh, you think it's all fine, doesn't need thinking about while it's there. Um, but the moment, I say, the moment people start saying, well, maybe we don't need to spend this money on these ensembles, on these festivals, um, what will be the arguments you will use uh, to try and oppose those cuts? Well, the problem is, uh, that that's, that's exactly it. <clears throat> I don't think there necessarily are convincing arguments, at least not to the people that would be in charge of dispensing the funds. So, for instance, you, you may have seen there's a, a rather well-known video on YouTube of Boulez... Uh, on a talk show with, uh, I think it's Michel Schneider, who was a you know, French, French minister of the time, who uh, who gets rather combative with Boulez, and, and they're talking about IRCAM, and uh, he says, well, IRCAM is costing, I don't remember the figure, it, it was a colossal amount of money. It's costing, you know, a significant percentage of the of the, the, the budget, the annual budget for, for music from the Ministry of Culture. And the minister was basically asking Boulez, how can you possibly justify the expense of an institution like this, given the extremely small amount of productions 
that that it's actually producing in terms of public concerts, in terms of anything that anybody in the general public could possibly either understand or 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 could attend. And of course, Boulez gets very angry and defensive and calls the minister a fraud. But he he basically sidesteps the question. He he's very defensive, very angry. Uh, but he doesn't acknowledge that there may be somewhere in there a totally legitimate question, given that it is public. It is public money. It is coming out of the taxpayer's pocket. So what is the justification for such a colossal expense, given that the vast majority of the population is never going to either attend a concert or benefit in any tangible way from that institution? Right. Well, I think it is possible to make some sorts of arguments there. But just uh, just to compare an even more mainstream example than your Boulez interview on, um, in the 1990s, there was a series here called The House, about the Royal Opera House. It was a documentary crew who followed them over an extended period. And it's widely credited with uh, doing no particular good to the Royal Opera House's reputation, because in this so elevated art form, uh, of course, you saw lots of very petty people going about their jobs, as you would in any institution of that size. But it sort of rather deflated a lot of its own mythology there. But there was one... Um, there was one episode which began uh, with the general manager, Jeremy Isaacs, uh, travelling to work in a taxi. And, I mean, it was clearly a bit set up, but you had the taxi driver asking some of the things that taxi drivers in London do. He says, oh, you're Jeremy Isaacs, aren't you? He says, yes, I am. Clearly a bit grumpy and not particularly wanting to talk to this taxi driver. He said, OK, can you just ask me something? And... Um, and the taxi driver was, was framed in a quite reasonable way, saying, well, why should all of people like me and other taxpayers who never go to the opera, why should our taxes go into this? And he just gave a very grumpy and very defensive response. And he says, well, if you're not happy, I suggest you take it up with your MP. Um, and he says, and we get the lowest subsidy in Europe, which is true. Um, but he wasn't prepared to engage the question. Mm. Um, and unfortunately, I think that's quite common, that people don't want to ask this question. Now, you could, I think, articulate an argument in terms of the advancement of musical knowledge and musical language, uh, which could be could be seen as a good in its own right, even if only a minority actually partake of that. But it could be seen to have other sort of side effects uh, and other byproducts. Well, I think if you, if you don't engage the question thoroughly, then the danger is that it will simply seem like a form of entitlement. Which it is. It is. And do you think the people who are chasing after the commissions on all the big festivals in Europe, uh, do you think that they, many of them have a sense of some sort of wider social responsibility? Or do you think they're thinking, what do I have to do to get the most lucrative commissions? Mm -hmm. And many of them think, well, I am a great composer, or at least I say so, yeah. so therefore I should get these commissions. And of course, there's more people wanting them than there are commissions to go around. And for one way, reason or another, some get the commissions, some don't. I'm not saying that's always a fair process. Uh, there's lots of factors involved, but then some get very embittered because they feel entitled to, to have these things. But you can sometimes frame their entitlement in terms that would make sense to other people in new music uh, with the value of their work. But framing them in terms that would make sense to a wider public is quite a bit harder to do. And as subsidy is gradually being cut, and as what we might call an avant-garde establishment, its position is looking more and more precarious uh, now, including in the light of new diversity initiatives uh, and so on. As that's happening, what you are starting to see is what I think rather desperate attempts to sort of suggest some social relevance, which is where you get a lot of music, which is distinguished more by which topical issues uh, it uh, fastens itself onto. Um, as if a way of saying, please, look, I, I'm... I'm writing a piece about the war in Ukraine, so therefore it's relevant and it's meaningful. Um, to which, as I was saying to you before, I would ask, well, why is that a piece of music? Uh, mm. um, and if you're writing a sort of 
yes, a slow lamentoso for string orchestra uh, uh, saying to the dead in Ukraine. Uh, I'm sorry, forget it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I've heard a hundred pieces of those, and they're pretty, you could take them from one traumatic event to another without having to change almost anything. Um, I mean, not, not so many people do that in the new music scene, but they're trying to frame discourse around their work in terms of anything other than its musical qualities. And musical abstraction and music's lack of an object, music's not being a figurative art primarily. Of course, I recognise as sort of uh, mimetic music and programmatic music and so on. But I don't think music is fundamentally a mimetic art. And that those things which I think are strengths are seen as weaknesses. Um, and I think this is just emblematic of a new music scene that's forced onto the defensive to some extent. The sense of entitlement is not being mirrored in wider public discourse, uh, which now lacks prominent and articulate figures such as Boulez, such as Stockhausen, and perhaps such as Carter. But well, those it, types of composers, they're all either very old or no longer with us now. It, it was politically expedient in France and Germany and other places in the post-war era to support contemporary forms of culture for various reasons. Uh, it's no longer the case. No. In fact, it's a, it's a liability. Uh, to, well, to the extent that the general population even thinks about these things, which I think is highly unlikely. But, but it, it's, no longer, it's no longer advantageous to, to say, well, look what we're doing for the, for the arts. You know, look what we're doing for contemporary music. Uh, so there, there's no reason to imagine that it would continue indefinitely. And, and my, my argument is that this... And to make things clear, I, I'm not for a minute suggesting that everything needs to be left up to market forces. Obviously, there are certain things that cannot be left up to the market. Uh, and I'm in favor of, of, of state support for, for cultural institutions, for museums, for symphony orchestras, for operas, and so on. Where it gets complicated, I think, is subsidies to individual artists uh, and how those, get, how, how those get decided, how they get distributed. Uh, that's very tricky, and I, my my sense now is that a better model is some kind of private funding or crowdfunding uh, for a lot of projects, and I think that that can actually work quite well. And part of the reason for that is there's, in those instances, a direct connection between the person commissioning or the group of people commissioning. There's a relationship between them and the artist. Be open to all sorts of potential sort of corruptibility, all sorts of favoritism. It could be some rich people uh, give their private money to other people from their own sort of milieu, their own background, and things like that. It could work very much against those who are not born to the backgrounds where they're going to have those sorts of contacts and things. I'd put, uh, moving towards private funding, I wouldn't really see as the way forward to be honest uh, crowd crowdfunding as well that's i mean i don't know how sustainable that is i mean you can do odd projects but whether someone could sustain enough to sort of keep working i'm less sure well the but, the, the, argue, the the alternative that's left then is making an absolutely airtight case for for continued public sub subsidizing of esoteric art forms yes and i think that can be done, but maybe they couldn't. Maybe the artistic priorities would have to change a bit. Um, maybe a bit more honesty would be needed about the traditions in which these are located. I mean, why should we not be equally giving money towards supporting things that are doing esoteric uh, things in popular music idioms and traditions? Why would they be any less deserving? Of it. There, there were quite a lot of extremely violent polemics around that in France, actually, or surrounding the, the Villa Medici, no, notably, oh, yeah. uh, when they decided to open that institution up to people working in popular domains, uh, singer-songwriters, for example. Uh, and the composers, of course, predictably, the, the older, more established composers were absolutely outraged at the idea that you're taking away a spot from us. We need this. We don't have anything else. And you're giving it to somebody in the popular field. And they're saying those people don't need it. They don't need it. If they're doing commercial 
singer-songwriting, of which there's a long tradition of at least some people uh, making a perfectly viable commercial income from that, then I would say they're right to say they don't need it. If they were doing something that somehow engages with stylistic aspects of it or other aspects of those traditions, but are taking it into some new realms, then that might be a different matter. And I suppose I do see... I do see value in art being able to experiment in art and not just sort of keep keep doing new experiments from the bottom up, but, uh, you know, starting developing new idioms and developing them over a period of time. Um, so where there's some continuity across an output, I think there is something to be said for, uh, for, for supporting that over an extended period. And I'll come back to that in terms of what you're saying about premieres in, in, in a second. Um, because, well, I would frame it in terms of that I think uh, a society which doesn't offer a space for those things to be developed and articulated um, is one that's somewhat impoverished in terms of knowledge, in terms of the forms of experience, the forms of thought that are made possible, even if they are for a minority. But most people, I believe have some sorts of minority interests. They're just not all the same, or they wouldn't be a minority. Mm -hmm. um, That's true. If I've, I've used this sort of analogy with television. Um, supposing you have um, 100 people and 101 television channels. Um, and suppose each of those channels uh, is only watched by one of those people except for the 101st, which everyone watches as well. Um, do you think any of those people would be happy if you got rid of the 100 and you were left with only number 101? Um, there is something to be said for, but for supporting minority interests. The problem is new music seems to support only one type of quite narrow minority interests and probably some different form of subsidy would have to be spread across a wider range of things where you can produce evidence that across the board uh, there's a range of engagement with all sorts of people at different parts of society. Um, we're a long way from that at the moment. Some places more than others. The, the, the Huddersfield, Huddersfield Festival, for example, is quite quite open to a very broad range of, uh, of styles and practices. Um, a similar thing happened with... But, the, you know, yes, but what about the audiences? I mean, how many... I know they do have a local audience at Huddersfield, and that matters, and that's been a very important factor in sustaining that festival. I mean, a local audience which isn't just visionaries, but is from a local community that, that have taken an interest in it. But still, for all the variety of styles and practices that there are on show at Huddersfield, what percentage of the British population, or even the population of parts of Yorkshire, ever listen to any of them? Mm -hmm. Where, if they had a range of things that lots of different uh, communities uh, uh, within that geographical area listen to, it might be a bit different. Uh, if that is the case already, I'd like to see the evidence for it. But I just wonder if I could come back to your question about premieres, because I think that's very important. And I've something I've often bemoaned uh, the the way that the Premier culture permeates so many of the institutions and the events, and it's almost invariably seen as a better thing to commission new works or play new works that are doing the circuit uh, than it is to go back to some other works which might have happened. Something I think very highly of James Dillon's Cycle Nine Rivers. Uh, it was all pretty much completed, except for a few details, by the early noughties um it's had a it's had a few performances but not that many i think that's i think that's an amazing cycle and would really reward uh more sustained exposure but most people would sooner commission a new work from dylan if they're if they're at a festival and i can and of course that has to be if if we didn't have the festivals commissioning things then a lot of the new things wouldn't get written and everything was new at some point in time but i think it's too extreme in terms of Yes, a fetishization of brand new. Um, something that's 10 years ago uh, can be 
Well, certainly, as far as the vast majority of any population is concerned, will be just as much new music as something something written now. And maybe if we had fewer premieres, which would actually save some money if you didn't have the same amount of uh, commission fees to pay, um, and a bit more revival of things, and a bit more giving things repeated listening, which they definitely need, uh, and also developing a performance tradition more for yes. those things <clears throat> as well. When well, I, I, since, I, since I've been in Britain on this trip, I've had the opportunity to meet with quite a few artistic directors of various uh, uh, ensembles and, and festivals and organizations. And one of the things that's emerged out of that is a lot of these people are very conscious of the need for that. And in fact, uh, increasingly inclined to, uh, when, when, when contemplating a, a commission project, they'll want to set it up in such a manner that the piece can be played four or five or six times or potentially be taken on tour. And they're increasingly moving away from this very, what I think is a very old-fashioned and 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 uh, ineffective model of of doing a, a premiere and then moving on to the next one. I think that's absurd, and I think that there's a, there's a lot of people that are recognizing that. And for composers, I would say, you know, don't be shy or hesitant about arguing in favor of that when you decide what projects you're going to take on. If the if the group wants to commission a piece from you and has no plans to ever do it again beyond the premiere then perhaps you may wish to hesitate uh, before accepting that project. Well, two thoughts there. I mean, absolutely, the move towards um, towards networks, I mean, where the model is a reso de uh, So a new work will get played in Ars Musica, it'll get played in Wien Modern, it'll get played in Huddersfield, it'll get played in Musica Strasbourg and so on, and... Um, there are many projects to ensure that commissions don't lead to just one performance, but a whole range of them. But it's usually a whole range in quite quick succession after each other, usually in what in one season, at least, so no more than a year. Um, I don't know of networks that will have things so that they'll be played once and then played five years later and then ten years later mm. and so on. And I know the objections that there are to some of these networks, that it... It turns the festival circuit into more of a monolith and more homogenous in its own way. Um, if basically all the big festivals are just uh, doing the doing the big names and the new works of those, um, there becomes less of a place for more distinct for festivals with more of their own sort of distinctive nature and character. So I suppose that's. But I don't see why you couldn't have a festival with its own distinctive character, but still isn't just focused on premieres. Um, so there's that factor for start, but there's also the question, are people writing music that will last? Or are they even wanting it to last? Um, let me think in the realms of... I mean, we're still talking with our point of reference being the work. Um, and in something like free improvisation, that really wouldn't be the case in the same way. I mean, yes, there are works of free improvisation, and there are some that are perhaps not quite so free or so improvised as as suggested to be when they're done on repeated occasions and there's quite a lot of commonality between them. But the event perhaps counts for more than uh, the than than the work and its permanency in that sort of genre. Now, if, to be if, fair, well, to be fair, not not all artists are necessarily preoccupied with posterity. No, no. So, and, and it's a, it's a completely legitimate standpoint, I think, to say, I'm making things for today, and I, if it lasts, it lasts, and if it doesn't, that's fine. But but I'm I'm interested in in doing what I want to do that reflects the current moment, and and fate will decide, and it, it fine. Yeah, absolutely fair enough. Um, no one, including the composers, can know for sure what will and won't last. Um, and trying self-consciously to write things for posterity brings its own set of problems. Uh, you can see that. So I suppose I wasn't so much thinking of composers writing, saying, well, I'll do the best I can and then let history take its course as far as how it's seen. I was thinking rather more of people writing more ephemeral and topical and of-the-moment things. Mm -hmm. Um and this is where, yes, I, I'm looking at free improvisation. I'm looking at certain sorts of community projects involving amateurs very in vogue at the moment and so on. And lots of things that 
might be more interesting for the participants than for the listeners. Um, and I do think that, if I'm really honest, uh, particularly with things involving amateurs, uh, and it's a bit of a taboo, but I've breached the taboo a bit. Uh, the, I'm not... I have. I'm not so convinced about an awful lot of work with amateurs, and I don't really like the role that amateurism has in British musical culture overall. Um, I don't think anyone would find it so problematic if I suggested that amateur dramatics are mostly for friends and family Mm -hmm. to see, um, and maybe a couple of others. And maybe, maybe amateur music making is the same. It, it, yes, it depends on the level of accomplishment of the amateur, of course, because in, in Germany, there's, of course, a, a very strong tradition of, of, uh, of, well, in fact, I know many people uh, in Strasbourg, for example, who are professionals in other fields. They might, be, uh, they might be diplomats, they might be working for the Council of Europe, they might be, uh, ab- uh, who have a, a, a degree in music. Uh, who are passionate about music, but are not simply not pursuing it as a career, but who are outstanding performers. No, absolutely. Oh, the, so. the new London Chamber Choir here, again, uh, not a professional choir, but one of the most outstanding, uh, their disc of Sennacus' choral works is one of the greatest Sennacus discs I think there's ever been. Um, and yes, some of the some of the amateur choirs there are more widely, not, not specific to new music. Uh, there is some fair degree of accomplishment there. But, well, in Britain, I think this means that people think rare, therefore we don't really need many professional choirs. And mm. that's the problem right. I I have there. But I'm thinking more of these community projects with amateurs. Uh, they may form some useful community social function, but I'm not sure they necessarily produce uh, really remarkable art. I mean, I've seen some, some exceptions. Some of the work that people like Gerhard Stabel and Kunzu Shim have done with amateurs or with school children has been absolutely remarkable, I think. Uh, really gripping stuff. Um, but it's very directed. I mean, both of them know exactly what they want from these people and can, and can get it. But I'm not really sure how much input beyond sort of doing what they're told the amateurs and others have in that. Um so what I'm saying is that if we're, if we're looking for something where you'll have more sustained traditions um, and where we will have repeated performances, there needs to be work which will stand up to that. That's quite right. Obviously, that is quite right. Yes. Yes, you, 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 would have to be, you would have to be aiming to produce work that can withstand that kind of scrutiny, yes. that kind of repeated listening. Yeah. Well, we should probably wrap this up. Uh, before we stop, though, is there anything you'd like to tell our listeners about what you're working on currently and uh, what you're doing at the moment? Well, uh, things have taken a certain new direction in my professional life that I've moved from uh, my university, City University of London, I've moved from the music department to the sociology department. I'm now professor of music, culture and society here. And there are a lot of continuities in terms of the type of teaching I do. I mean, I've taught about music and some aspects of wider culture in social context for a long time. And if anything, I probably find there's a more hospitable culture in the new department I'm in towards what I'll say is a dialectical view of the relationship between what I call culture with a medium sized C, which means not just high culture, it can be popular culture as well, but it means things specifically designated as culture. It doesn't just mean the whole realm of human activity, which is the more anthropological definition. But when I say dialectical model, I mean between that type of culture and the rest of society, there are all sorts of interplays, interactions, um, but it's not a simple deterministic relationship. You can't say because a society is a particular way, it'll therefore automatically produce this type of culture. Um, the culture isn't just a byproduct of society. The culture is equally part of society and can exist in a critical uh, relationship with the rest of society. Now, that's widely accepted amongst a lot of cultural sociologists, perhaps not so much amongst some music sociologists and music anthropologists and so on. So it's actually refreshing to find a much sort of uh, more, what I say, a more open intellectual culture with respect to that and lots of other things in here. So, you know, I teach more widely about culture, not just about music, and I teach about classical social theory, but I will be teaching more about music uh, as a social phenomenon as well. Um, Beyond that, I'm still playing. I've been playing perhaps more uh, 
traditional repertoire in the last few years. In uh, in 2022, I did this uh, big cycle of all nine of Liszt's versions of Beethoven's Symphony, and I followed it up with doing his version of the Symphony Fantastique last year of Berlioz as well. And, you know, I'm looking for new and interesting ways of combining uh, the old and the new, which is something I've done for a long time, but uh, it's more fundamental to me now. Um, so I'm doing that. I'm doing lots of writing. I'm writing a new biography of Stockhausen for Reaction Books. Uh, I'm working on other books on musical modernism in Germany after 45 and on the history of specialist music schools uh, in Britain. Um, and a whole range of articles. Um, and I've been writing more for non-academic outlets. I've done, uh, oh, since since 2022, I've published all 11 articles in the Times Higher Education uh, Journal um, on lots of things to do with education, and including to do with music, but not just that. Um, I've written more stuff for the London Review of Books, for the Critic, uh, and you're trying to, again, not always on music, um, but very much on cultural issues and cultural and political issues. And those things are very important to me. And the opportunity to engage with wider audiences, also at public events where I've, I've given talks and things, is really important. And it's made me realise the value of that for, for academics. Um, I think... There is certainly value in academics working on something without necessarily knowing where it's going to lead, just like we were talking about with musicians. And much knowledge has been generated without necessarily clear endpoints at the beginning. And that's the whole nature of research. You don't necessarily know what your research will tell you in the end. But there has to come some point at which um, various forms of culture, of thought, of intellectual activity, that if they must if if they've never had any discernible, even indirect impact outside of small uh, circles, then their, their value, surely uh, it's fair to question that. And I've, I've thought about this in the context of academic writing on culture, including, including the realms of cultural studies and so on, which I think is distinct from cultural sociology. Um you can produce any number of journal articles which will get hardly read, which have very very jargon-ridden um, particular takes on cultural phenomena and so on. Now, I don't expect journal academic journal articles to be read by a wide readership. They're not done for that purpose. But I might expect that some of their core arguments might be distilled and find their way into writings for a... For a a wider audience and that's to some extent what i'm trying to do through my wider writing and things and that there are academics who are very hostile to that they they don't ever want to sort of be asked any questions about what the wider impact or relevance of their work is and i think that's unsustainable in the long run and you know just like we're talking about possible crises and lack of faith in the realm of new music uh the same sort of things are happening uh, in universities and certainly in Britain and in some other countries, but I think particularly in Britain, now that we have about half the population uh, graduating from high school going into university, it's forced questions about what university is for. And you can't just answer them in the same way as you did when only 20% population it was like it was something like that or not much more when i was a student um and you the whole model of the relationship between research and teaching has to be looked at again and the whole model of what which disciplines matter inevitably does and this has been happening but it's made life difficult for those working in what seem like very esoteric disciplines when they're not they're no longer succeeding in generating the same interest from young people are studying those things. Um, and cause you do ultimately need students for a university. They're not, they may be primarily research things, but they can't be only research things, or, or at least a whole sector can't be sustained that way. And how we can maintain aspects of real sort of critical knowledge generation um, whilst 
also teaching things that young people will find engaging and important. And we can somehow demonstrate to the wider society which we expect to fund our activities, how, how what we do has some other meaning. I think those things can't be ignored and need to be. And there's difficult times coming ahead. The British university sector has been had a situation where fees were frozen in 2017 at 9250 per year for for home undergraduate students. Uh, so in real terms, this means that the amount of money that each institution has coming in is going down every year, whilst, whilst it's frozen, as they can't go up with inflation. At the same time, Brexit meant a real reduction of EU students. New visa laws are making it harder for other foreign students to come and certain subjects, uh, including music, are finding cuts in secondary provision here. So there isn't the same demand generated amongst potential students. So we've just recently seen that the music department in Oxford Brooks uh, was scheduled to be closed down together with some other departments, like including the Department of Maths. Uh, and there were going to be cuts in other well, was particularly arts and humanities. Um, unfortunately, I foresee in the next five or ten years, because other factors are going to make the financial position even more precarious in universities, we may see other cuts. And we need to be adaptable and flexible and be prepared to sort of countenance new ideas of what the university is for, whilst holding on to what's best here. And that's very much what I'm engaged with in what I'm writing about those subjects, just like with music. Ian Pace, thank you very much. Always a pleasure to talk with you. Likewise, thank you.